it couldn't be anything other than a pleasure just to spend an hour in this fantastic space. We do have at the Temple Church where I serve an unexpected link with Salisbury. In 1703, the young and thrusting Thomas Sherlock became master of the temple, that is, my own predecessor. Thirty years later, he also became Bishop of Salisbury, but he saw no reason to give up the temple at all, so he just did them both. And five years after that, he was in contention to become either the Bishop of London or the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he proposed to do all three at once. Those were the days. We have, um, uh, we have masses to do with Magna Carta ourselves. Of course, we don't have one, unlike yourselves. But um, we have the great hero of Runnymede, William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, who is buried in the Temple Church. And uh, the church was built in 1162. It was John's London headquarters in the crisis leading up to Magna Carta. Uh, you have William Longspay uh, just across the central aisle, one of the other heroes uh, of the king's faction, who remained loyal to the king like William Marshall, but insisted that the king seal the charter, and then at the Battle of Lincoln with William Marshall, our hero, saw the French off, roundly off the field of battle. So it's very nice to be here. Uh, you are, as it were, adoring mothers of Magna Carta, and quite right too. I think at the temple we regard ourselves as a doting aunt, really, and we are very proud of the connection that we have. What I'd uh, like to do, if I may, is speak for something like 45 minutes, uh, and then very glad to answer questions. As Ed says, if I become unintelligible, either because I drop the microphone or because I start speaking like a racing commentator, please do raise your hand and say so. I realize I have a tendency to gabble, and uh, uh, I will then try, just try to sort of moderate slightly. What I'd like to do, uh, if I may, is ask uh, this evening, why are we celebrating Magna Carta? Why bother? What are the celebrations going to achieve? Hmm. What good is going to be in place or underway in five years' time, thanks to the celebrations of the anniversary, which would not be in place or underway without that celebration? What difference is this anniversary going to make? If I may, I'm going to tell um, a, a long story in three and a half very short chapters in order to raise the question more sharply. Here is the first of my chapters. In 1205, Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, was sent into exile. He remained in exile till 1213. He spent much of the time in Paris, where he became one of the leading authorities on the Old Testament. He wrote two commentaries on every book in the Old Testament. His chief passion was the theory of kingship, biblical kingship, as enunciated in the book of Deuteronomy and as realized in at least some parts of ancient Israel's life. And he generated a theory of such covenantal kingship, whereby God, king, and people are in a triangular relationship. God is in office, the king is in office under God and is answerable to God. And the people under God have the authority to resist the king if the king abandons God's law. It was pure theory. An act. But in 1213, he is resummoned to England, and he becomes genuinely the Archbishop of Canterbury again, armed with this theory of biblical kingship and confronting an England that by then is on the verge of civil war thanks to the abuses of King John. Langton is extraordinarily brave. He lands at Dover and he demands instantly of the king that the king shall promise, publicly undertake, to take no action against any subject except by due process of the law. Within weeks, the king threatens to turn his army northwards against the rebel barons 
And Langton says, no, you cannot do so without a judgment of your court or council. In 1214, this is very convenient, the barons were all assembled in St. Paul's Cathedral. Langton <clears throat> discovers a copy of the coronation charter of the deeply revered King Henry I, and he reads it out to the barons, and he tells them effectively, if you want to get the king under control, this is the charter upon which you should base your demands. Uh, this was extraordinarily convenient. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, the foundation of his own theory of biblical kingship, had been discovered and the, uh, 2,000 years before, and the young King Josiah, appalled to discover how far he as king had strayed from the ways of God, converted his entire kingdom to such biblical kingship. And now, in 1214, by some um, Langton discovers Henry I's charter at the very moment when the barons are gathered in St. Paul's. Langton remains loyal to the king. Of course he does. And yet he is throughout the next nine months of crisis advising the barons, telling them how far they can go, where they must draw back, what they can really expect and what they can't. He is um, among the king's advisors at Runnymede. He is the first named advisor of the king. And when eight weeks later, the Pope annuls Magna Carta and demands the excommunication of anyone who wishes to remain loyal to it, Archbishop Langton refuses to exercise that excommunication. Langton's a brave man. Langton is a seriously brave man. And he is absolutely in the thick of the constitutional crisis, which was in danger of leading to an intolerable civil war. He came, he came back from France to realize that King John had all... Uh, I'm inaudible. I'm sorry, I don't mind using a fixed mic. I just, I just don't like hiding behind a lectern. It's, so it's sort of so defensive. You know, I, don't, I don't know. I... Anyway, tough. Oh, well, it may have been improvement, actually, but, but uh, anyway, I, I would... Anyway, I'm, I'm now protected by this thing. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Langton... Uh, king John had already murdered the only really viable alternative to the king, uh, to the throne, his own nephew, Arthur. His own son was only five or six, and a child king is a disaster, and the king of France was waiting to invade. Langton realised, you've got to keep King John on the throne, but he must seal a charter granting rights to the barons. As an example of statecraft, Langton's role is formidable. And all of it was shaped by his theory of biblical kingship in which the king would be answerable to God and subject to discipline by his own subjects if he broke the law of God. And the Charter itself? I feel rather embarrassed now because I know that some of you have um, you've, you've heard more about Magna Carta in the last few months than is good for anybody's health, I suspect. I, I don't know how many of you have actually read it. Have you read it? Oh, well, for the, it looks as if it, I mean, some of you have read it, but, but for those of you who haven't, may I just say this? I'm sorry, this is fantastically disloyal. Magna Carta is a disaster. I mean, it, you, you read it and it, it goes on forever and it's completely dire. It's all, about, it's all about fishing rights in the Thames, rabbiting rights in the king's forests, and the amount of dowry a rich widow had to pay in order to have the king's permission to marry a second husband of her own choice. Oh, you can lose the will to live. You then reach clause 39. No free man will be arrested, seized, dispossessed, exiled or in any way harmed without the lawful judgment of his equals or the law of the land. Clause 40. 
To no man will we sell, to no man will we delay or deny right or justice. Clause 41, fishing rights on the Thames. <laughs> it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. But those two clauses, just, just bear those two clauses in mind. They are still on the statute book. They have been written into every common law constitution in the world, which directly protect now over two billion people. And they are now part, almost word for word, of every human rights in instrument of the 20th century. Imagine what our world would be like without them. What shall we think of? Russia, perhaps. Just imagine. Do you know, I was, um, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, jurists from all over the world coming to uh, the temple because we look after lawyers in London. And uh, quite recently, we had a group of young Romanian barristers who were very honest. And one of them, I mean, man in his 30s, he said, he said, really, life is so much better now that the Ceausescus have gone. Because nowadays, you can actually defend a case against the government without putting yourself and your family into physical danger. This, he said, is a great improvement. On the other hand, he said, it is still made quite clear to you, if you are minded to take some cases, that no barrister who wishes to make a healthy living for himself or his children would really want to bother to undertake such a case. And if you do want to take it, the moment you arrive in court, you know perfectly well that the case has already been decided against you. It is, I think, easy for us to forget how securely we can rely upon freedoms and rights which large parts of the world can hardly dream of. There are two other, at least two other, great principles of the Charter which uh, we, we shouldn't ignore as we go by, winging by. Uh, the first is uh, an earlier clause in which it is made clear that the king can raise tax only by the common council of the realm and the council must be assembled in a set place at a set time at least four weeks' notice from the time of its announcement to give everyone who can get there time to get there. This becomes the principle of no taxation without representation. And it is the basis of all restraints upon executive power because the executive always wants to spend money. And if you won't give them their money, they are powerless. No taxation without representation. And the third great principle is uh, that of the security clause. And this is the moment at which Magna Carta, it's, it's extraordinary, it, it leaves its own generation and reaches centuries into the future. The king could, like all his predecessors, agree to anything. But there was no way in any previous regime of enforcing such charters. So John agreed to the appointment of 25 barons whose job it would be to check that he conformed to the charter's terms. And if anyone thought that he was delinquent, they could go to the 25 barons, complain, and the barons would sit in judgment on the king. 25 of them. They, too, would meet at several weeks' notice in a fixed place so they could get there. As many of them as were there were by that very fact quarrelled, and if they disagreed about the king's conformity to the charter, they would vote on it, and a straightforward majority of those voting won the day. And if they decided that he was delinquent, they could order every subject to join them in seizing the king's castles, lands, and possessions. It's astonishing. It, it, it's completely astonishing. It was also, of course, wholly unsustainable. Uh, the king effectively dethroned himself, and within weeks he had appealed to the pope to say, I was forced to sign this document, to seal this document, and uh, this document is not compatible with my own dignity or the kingdom's, you must annul it, and the Pope did, instantly. He said, that this is a completely unconscionable clause, and so the entire charter was annulled within eight weeks. 
Magna Carta was initially a failure, and civil war broke out. Everything that Langton had urged and fought for was undone within weeks of the Charter being sealed, and it was only after John's death in 1216 that the Charter begins to reform, to reassert itself, and to be reissued in order to make peace with the rebel barons, and that security clause is omitted after 1215, and frankly it is not until the end of our chapter 2 in, tw in uh, 1689 in this country that the king was finally brought under control. But I ask you to remember that security clause. It, way out of time, wholly unsustainable, but a harbinger of control upon the executive realized centuries later upon which we now rely entirely for our freedom. Uh, who benefited from Magna Carta? It's actually, it is worth addressing this. Uh, actually, it is worth addressing this because it's easy to think that Magna Carta was really little more than an oligarchic coup uh, by a bunch of um, powerful barons. It's not true. The beneficiaries of Magna Carta were the free men of the realm. To know how many free men there were is extremely difficult, but something like half to two-thirds of the population were free. It's a very ambiguous definition. The whole thing is extremely complicated. This is not the, the takeover by 185 plutocrats controlling the king by taking all the nation's assets for themselves. No. Over half the nation is free, and Clause 60 insists that all the rights that the king has granted to his own tenants-in-chief, that is the barons, they in turn, by a cascade of rights, must grant to their own tenants and so on down the line. So that what, it, what the charter actually talks about, which indeed largely involves king and barons, is to percolate downwards through the free Royal, uh, uh, levels of society, not to the villains. The villains and serfs, the unfree, were not benefited by the charter, but over half the population was. And did it matter? Well, Sir James Holt, who died last year, the greatest of all cru uh, historians of the charter, was always rather skeptical about its effect and importance. He would never let it be overstated. But he said repeatedly, that it was the charter that established something that we can recognize as the community of the realm, in which the barons, a small group, of course, of extremely powerful men, of course, were actually charged with the protection and guardianship of the entire realm. They begin to form a community. And time and again in Magna Carta, you hear that the king agrees not to act, act except by the common council of the realm. He must call upon the council for their council. Same word in Latin, concilium. And so Holt, who was absolutely not a gauzy-eyed romantic about the charter, insisted that actually in the charter, the realm of England starts becoming a community in which even and especially the king is an integral part and is not set aside and able to impose his mere force and will upon his subjects. We are a long, long way from modern democracy. There's no, no point in pretending that this is some blueprint for parliament, but it is a pivotal moment in our own nation's history and therefore in the, na in the history of the entire common law world influenced by English law ever since. So, chapter two. Chapter two and three are rather shorter. Here's chapter two. Uh, Magna Carta by the uh, end of the 16th century frankly had been forgotten, if one's really honest. Well, it was like most foundations. I mean, a, a building is built upon the foundations, and guess what? You forget the foundations. Of course you do, because you're looking at the building. Magna Carta was indeed a foundation of future developments, but it was just a foundation. Then enter the Stuarts, and the early Stuart kings had an understanding of kingship from Scotland, radically diverse from the Tudors. 
James I said, kings are justly called gods, as it is blasphemy to dispute what God may do, so it is sedition to question what the king may do in the height of his power. The king ruled by divine right, and his word was law. By the 1620s, terrible trouble was brewing. Charles I, to protect his own favourite Buckingham, had dissolved Parliament, desperately needed money to fight two wars, and invoked two forced loans without parliamentary permission. That is, taxation, the loans were forced, without any form of representation. Several gentry refused to pay. They were arrested and imprisoned. How could this possibly be in accordance with the process laid down by Magna Carta? They lost their case, but the tide of opinion against the king became unbearable. And in the 1627 to 8, he was forced to yield the petition of right. And there were tearful, tearful scenes in the House of Commons as at last it was realized that the king would accede to the petition of right and yield limits to his own sovereignty. There was one moment in 28 when one of the king's allies found a rather weaselly form of words which would save to the king his own proper sovereignty. Sir Edward Cook, the greatest lawyer of his day, said, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. If we will allow this clause, then we will have a sovereign over all our laws. But the world has changed. The heroes of the hour are no longer the archbishop. The witnesses are no longer the bishops who surrounded John. It is now the parliamentarians and the lawyers who are the heroes of the hour, and it is the king who is appealing to God for his own God-given right to rule. The world is changing. My chapter 3 uh, involves less of a, a leap in time, but we have to go 3,000 miles to the west. The early American colonies had all of their constitutions in the early 17th century based upon Magna Carta, without a doubt. I mean, absolutely straightforward. But by the 1760s, as the American Revolution drew near, the colonists were faced with an, a wholly unexpected problem, that they were, their rights granted to them in their own early constitutions on the basis of Magna Carta were being whittled away by Parliament and King in London. And there came a stage when they insisted that their rights must be as secure as the rights of true-born Englishmen in England and could not be voted away by legislative fiat. Not only then were they going to free themselves from London's parliamentary control, they were going to free their own rights from any parliamentary control for the danger that otherwise demagogues or parties or governments would arise, which would once more try to abrogate their rights. The colonists went for a constitution. And in the uh, arguments that led to the American Constitution, there were prolonged arguments whether the real basis for human rights and dignity were the law of God, or the law of nature. Why does this matter? Well, I'm a churchman, and I see the role of the church and of the law of God just drifting away yet further. Most of us here, with a sympathy I suspect for the church, would acknowledge that it is far harder to base our trustable, secure understanding of the equal rights of all humanity upon the fact of our shared humanity alone. Far stronger, it seems, is the defense of those rights if we are all equal in the love of and under the universal law of God. So there were indeed those, of course there were, who insisted that the equality of rights that the American citizen would thereafter have were given to her or him by God. 
but there was also a movement towards mere natural law, self-evident truths that needed no higher sanction than themselves. And such has been the tide of all human rights thought ever since. Increasingly secular, verging increasingly away from the church's concerns and priorities, we are often in parallel, but it would be a rare human rights instrument indeed in our present age that invoked religion or God at all. And my fourth chapter, ah oh well, my fourth chapter I can't write yet. I mean, we must write it. We, we, we've, we've got to write it. What about Magna Carta now? What about it? I think, to be honest, to be honest, the heavy work has been done. The really heavy work in, uh, was done by Magna Carta in this country by 1689 and the Glorious Revolution, in America by 1791 and the Bill of Rights. Actually, that's when it had really happened. And thereafter, Magna Carta becomes, we might just say, a mere symbol. One should be very careful, of course, about dismissing mere symbols. Symbols are extremely important. Uh, in the middle of um, World War II, the Lincoln Cathedral Magna Carta was in America. It had gone there just before the war and had basically got stuck there. And Churchill thought it would be a gesture of extraordinary magnanimity and effect to give the Lincoln Cathedral Magna Carta to America to first to encourage them into the war, and then, as it were, to seal our friendship in the protection of human freedom. Churchill was absolutely gung-ho about this. His advisers did have to point out, but Prime Minister, you don't own it. It, it belongs to Lincoln Cathedral, and I very, very much doubt the Dean and Chapter will want to see it go. How true, how very true. So what are we going to do with this, this symbol? And really in this country, it's little more now. Uh, I, 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 gather, I gather from practitioners that if, a, if an advocate in this country invokes Magna Carta, the judge will look over her or his half-moon spectacles and say, Mr. Smith, really, do you have nothing more recent to bring to the court's attention? In America, it's still invoked quite regularly. Uh, it was a very famous case about Guantanamo Bay in 2004 when Magna Carta was successfully invoked uh, in uh, the Supreme Court in America, but not because in America it is, as it were, a proto-constitution, as it is not here. But symbols are important. We are an ancient nation. We really are. We have deep roots. I think most of us suspect that our current world moves too fast, too fluidly, and we value those roots that keep us stable and settled and remind us where we have come from and over how long a period and how long and with what hard work over generations it has taken us to get where we are. And so to remember something like Magna Carta for all its oddities and all its present anachronisms is to remember an early staging post in that development of our freedoms without which our lives would now be wholly unrecognizable in the lives that we actually are privileged to live. Symbols can also, after all, be a source of unity. It's easy to think, come on, how on earth could Magna Carta be of any help in multicultural Britain. Well, did you see at the burial of Richard III last week in Leicester, the streets were lined with Sikh children. As it were, it gradually, slowly, slowly, but gradually, he is, as it were, becoming their king too. It's going to take generations, of course it is, but a sense of belonging here so that what has been a symbol for many of us all through our lives becomes a symbol for those families and those communities more recently arrived. All the better for being distant. All the better for not being part of today's politics. For being something foundational, deep, distant, and yet utterly resonant with our present day lives, freedoms and rights. Let us not belittle the power of the symbol. 
um, on that basis, I think that some objections to our celebration of the Charter are simply miscued. The most, f he actually probably is actually, the most famous sitting judge in England at the moment, a man of outstanding brilliance, gave a lecture at the British Library only last week in which, frankly, he was rather disobliging about Magna Carta and said that many mad things are being said about it and if he tried to say anything new, he would have to succumb to madness too. So he said he was going to say nothing new about it. And indeed, he said, he really could not see what all the fuss is about. Are we really going to claim, he said, that John or the barons knew what their work would lead to or intended it to have such an effect? No. No, of course not. I, I rather doubt that William the Conqueror thought that his descendant a thousand years later was going to be sitting on the throne of England. But that doesn't mean that we will neglect the Battle of Hastings in 2066 quite surprised if Shakespeare thought that there would be a memorial theatre to him in his birthplace. Does that mean that we're going to boycott Stratford? I mean, the, the, I mean the, of course it's true. It was never in anyone's mind. So what, frankly? So what? This most distinguished and brilliant judge ended this lecture, which has gained some notoriety, by saying, must our freedoms rarely rely upon the actions of some northern millionaires who spoke French and died over 700 years ago? No, of course not. But that does not prevent the work of those northern millionaires having had an effect upon our polity. Why should, why should we deny it? What an, what, an, what an odd set of Aunt Sally's to set up against the Charter. I don't understand it. But I do, I do, and um, within 10 minutes I'll close because uh, it's time for some questions. I, I do have, I have rather different concerns about the Charter's celebration, and I, I air them diffidently, uh, especially in a place like this, uh, and if I feel uh, that I have any right to do so at all, it is because I live and work in a place as ancient and as beautiful and as well-established as Salisbury Cathedral. The temple, as I say, the temple church was built in the 1160s. We have been there ever since. We have our history of our own, and the, the, the temple as an area is as beautiful a curtilage and as privileged as the close of Salisbury Cathedral. We, we, share, we share an atmosphere and an environment. So what do I fear about the Charter's celebration? 800 years ago, a city such as Salisbury, or a curtilage such as the Temple, really was at the heart of England's political, social, and economic life. But I think if we were honest, we would admit that the heart of England no longer rests quite in such places as ours. It has moved on to great conurbations to which the close at Salisbury or the temple in London are wholly alien and completely unknown. I think, and I, 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 I am happy to be disabused of this in questions, but I think there is a certain demographic of enthusiasm for the Charter. I myself am a fervid member of the National Trust. I'm a friend of the Royal Academy. I love going to the opera and I adore ancient churches. Mm. And I suspect quite a high proportion of those who are enjoying the Charter's celebration may share some of these characteristics. The last, the last sort of influx of people we had at the Temple Church were there to mark the Da Vinci Code in which I feature the master of the temple is mentioned as being famous for having a perfectly foul temper. It is just possible that Dan Brown came there one day and asked what I thought was a pretty stupid question about the Holy Grail, and I might have been slightly brisk in my reply. 
Well, he has his revenge, and 80 million people around the world know about my foul temper. I had been smiling fixedly ever since. <laughs> well, well, if you want a craze, if you really want, to, if you really want a craze, I mean, go, uh, believe me, believe me, go for the Da Vinci Code. I mean, un- unbelie- unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. Actually, it was fantastic. Sorry, I, I'm not going to talk about it. It was fantastic. I mean, I'm a big, I am a priest, and uh, and we had uh, we had every day for three years. We had five or six hundred people every single day coming into the church asking about Jesus. I mean, it was to die for. I admit they were asking some slightly unusual questions about Jesus, but I mean, so what? You know, I don't mind. I mean, it was great. It was absolutely fantastic. Well, I, 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 spe- I stand, I stand in, the, in, the, in the temple church now waiting for floods of people to come in of all sorts, sizes, ages, uh, backgrounds, enthused by Magna Carta. <laughs> Not yet. So I wonder... And I wonder, why does this matter? This really, this really only matters uh, if, if what actually the Charter in its celebration becomes is a sort of cocoon of, of history and pageantry, very decorous and splendid, but actually able to divert us from some of the more trenchant and pressing questions that we should be addressing. We could end up loving the history and the pageantry, and actually forgetting in all the rhetoric what the reality was there for. Um, if, you hear, if you hear human rights lawyers talk about Magna Carta, it, it, you, you should try it if you have a meeting. You should just press the button, try Magna Carta. They will, go, they, will, they will explode. Of course they believe in Magna Carta. Of course they do. They believe in fair trial. Of course they do. And access to justice. Of course they do. So why is the government slashing the legal aid budget so that people no longer have access to the courts? Why is this government threatening to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights? They, they don't, fanfare of trumpets for Magna Carta <laughs> until, until, until its, it, its principles actually become rather awkward. That's the, that might be a danger. And I think, if I may say so, and I say it very warily here, here of all places, I think that might be a danger for the church as well, actually. Uh, we're, we're very keen on Magna Carta. I actually, I actually went to Synod, General Synod, uh, to, to speak up for, um, for Magna Carta last year. Uh, I, it was rather a well-chosen setting, actually. The, the motion, I was rather disappointed. When I turned up, there was no one there. They'd all gone to have tea. I thought it was very disappointing. It turned out the reason was that 30 seconds before, they had voted by acclamation to appoint women to the bishops of the Church of England. Hooray! But it did mean that Magna Carta was rather, was rather sort of low on the priority, if you see what I mean. But we're very keen on Magna Carta in the church, and we really are, and um, as Salisbury's going for it, we're going for it, we really are. And we believe in absolute equality before the law and human rights, we really do, and it, actually we all believe in secular democracy now, we do. What a relief it is then that the Church of England has now at last managed to appoint three women bishops? It did take us a while. And I don't, haven't noticed the Roman Catholic or Orthodox churches following suit yet. E- equality? Well, sort of. And uh, the church still, as you know, the church still can't, uh, can't, hasn't got a clue what to do about gays, as we know. Um, here's, this is rather a bad story, really. But I mean, it, it's, sort of such a, it's such a classically bad story, I'm going to tell it. About five years ago, there was a diocese in the west of England uh, who was who advertised? Yeah, they advertised for um for a youth worker, and a young man turned up who told the panel in in an interview. Uh, he said he said I'm gay, I'm I have no partner, so I'm currently chaste, but I'm gay and I'd like this job. And the diocese turned him down, and they wrote him a letter saying that you are currently chaste, so you are not living in sin. But if you were ever to get a partner, it would be a sinful union because it would be homosexual. Therefore, we won't employ you. That's right. Um, it, the, the damages were only £50,000 and full costs. How can you do it? I mean, how, 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 how on earth, how can you do it? You talk about the rule of law and, and equality of rights and, and you behave like that? Something very rum. We, of course, believe in democracy. We do believe in democracy. We also, of course, believe, and I, as it happens, I think we're right to believe, 
in, um, in having uh, a representation of our own bishops in the House of Lords, in the legislature of England. I mean, I, I think it's an extremely good thing. But whatever it is, it is not secular democracy. That's all. It, 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 it's something else. And I think we should be honest about it. There's a, there's a fantastic woman called Mary Warnock who... Um, uh, has had many, many co uh, consultations on the beginning and end of life. She's fantastically distinguished, uh, uh, and she, uh, she's basically quite sympathetic to the church. She's in a, in a rather sort of Anglican tea time sort of way. And, uh, but, but when there was a debate about five years ago on, uh, on the end of life, and she was having very, very fruitful conversations with a Roman Catholic peer, until one day he came up to her in the House of Lords and said, Mary, I'm terribly sorry, but I really can't carry on this conversation with you any longer because this morning I got a letter from my cardinal telling me to vote against your measure. So the issue is closed. Mary Warnock was incandescent. You, 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 you are part of our legislature and you are just taking orders from some outside religious body? She's very good until she gets angry, and then she's even better. You see what I mean? Anyway, uh, so what are we going to try and achieve over the next, uh, next five years? What's this celebration going to achieve? Well, uh, I, 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 hope, I hope that we will recognize, going back to that security clause of 1215, that actually Magna Carta was a radical document, way ahead of its time. And if we think of it only as a piece of medieval pageantry of which we are hugely proud as part of our ancient history, I think we frankly miss the point. And a huge opportunity. It was a radically forward-looking document. I hope we'll look outwards as well. I hope we will think of those Romanian lawyers and others like them in many jurisdictions of the world where it is still impolitic at best and very, very dangerous at worst to oppose the government. Within the church, well, I hope we will regain the confidence, all of us, that Archbishop Justin is showing for genuine heartfelt engagement in our public life. Whatever Langton was doing in 1215, he was not burying himself in an anchorite's cell. He was absolutely in the thick of it. And our nation owes him a huge debt of gratitude for his work then. So I hope that we will recover with our far diminished resources and means and authority and power something at least of that confidence. I hope that we will rediscover our role in fortifying community as Magna Carta did, the generation of our nation as a single cohesive community for all of its wild divergent parts. And do I think that the church itself will be transformed in the next five years into a secular democracy? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, and anyway, I mean, why should one even hope for it? Of course it won't happen. I mean, why, indeed, why should it? There was actually, there was a rather terrific moment in relation to the church and democracy when Archbishop Justin was um, about to be uh, made Archbishop. He was in Russia with Foreign Secretary Lavrov of Russia. And um, Justin told the Foreign Secretary, Foreign Minister, I'm sorry, I really, I'm loving your country, but I must go home because... Tomorrow, I am going to be elected Archbishop of Canterbury, in Canterbury. And Lavrov says, with a rather sardonic smile, well, shouldn't you be back there rustling up the votes and canvassing your supporters? To which Justin says, ah, oh, well, no. No, it's not quite that sort of election. I am, in fact, the only candidate and it is certainly criminal and probably treasonous to vote against me. At this point, Lavrov leans forward with an eager look. Oh, I say, he said, that's the sort of election I can understand. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>